participants, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends of science, technology, and innovation, I am very pleased to welcome you to this important webinar discussing innovation from inception to diffusion and the role of academia in the creation and transfer of knowledge. In this virtual webinar, I recognize some familiar names of participants from academia, governments, the private sector, and major groups. You've all worked tirelessly throughout the last years to advance the innovation agenda in your respective roles and organizations in accordance with our leadership directions and their inspirational and long-term visions. We're proud that at a country level, the UAE has made notable advancements and achievements in the last few years. In a global innovation index, 2021, UAE ranks first in the Arab region, third among the 19 economies in Northern Africa and Western Asia, and 33rd globally, moving from the 36th rank in, in 2021. In terms of entrepreneurship, the UAE ranks first worldwide by the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, Jan 2021. This is obviously notable achievements and puts the UAE on the global innovation and entrepreneurship map. Major country level achievements include the host of Expo 2020, the launch of the UAE Space Agency, the UAE reached to Mars for the first time with its hope probe and many others. However, this is only the beginning of the journey. The ambitions of the UAE under our visionary, visionary leadership have no limits. According to the UAE Centennial 2071, launched by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, our ultimate objective for the UAE is to become the most innovative country in the world and one of the best economies worldwide by 2071. The main pillars for the UAE Centennial 2071 include excellent education and a diverse knowledge economy. We all understand the importance of education and the role of higher education institutions in the creation and the transfer of knowledge. Though we have excellent academic institutions and strong entrepreneurship bases, yet to be completely objective and constructive in our assessment, there is still an important gap to bridge between the inception of innovations coming from higher education institutions and their diffusion to the market. In this context, in this context this webinar will discuss the role of higher education institutions and the role they play in knowledge creation and transfer, and how higher education institutions can collaborate with the Triple Helix and beyond to promote innovation and entrepreneurship and support social and economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that by participating in this webinar, we are in the right place and the right time. Together, let us accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up of good practices to expedite our growth and to bring us a step closer to our ambitious objective. I wish you all a very successful webinar. As a head up to our webinar, our webinar will last for uh, one hour and a half, so we we'll set to start the agenda, uh, the first session immediately, and we should finish by uh, 5.30 p.m. Dubai, Dubai time. So the agenda is as follows. We'll have two sessions. The first session will include a keynote presentation by Mr. Professor uh, Phil Budden, a senior consultant technological innovation, entrepreneurship, and strategic management from MIT Sloan School of Business, followed 
followed by a discussion and a Q&A session. The second session will be moderated by Dr. Nihal Shabra and will discuss the role of higher education institutions in the creation and transfer of technology and will include five keynote panelists, Professor Fakhri Karey, Provost from Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, Dr. Mohammed Al Himayri, Head of Technology Transfer Office, University of Sharjah, Dr. Yahya Marzuki, Advisor at the CEO Office at Tawazun, Dr. Sami Bashir, Director, Technology Management and Innovation, and Interim CEO of Khalifa Innovation Center at Khalifa University, and Dr. Bebhab Sharma, Intellectual Property and Commercialization Executive at the American University of Sharjah. I would like to invite now Professor uh, Phil Baden to start the keynote presentation, please, which will be around uh, the creation of innovation ecosystems and the lessons learned from Amai. Ahmad, thank you very much for that kind invitation. And um, after I've done my presentation, I think you and I are going to have a discussion. Is that right? That's right, Professor. Excellent. So let me draw up my slides. And Ahmad, how long would you like to speak for before you and I have our discussion and we take questions? You have 20 minutes, Professor. If you would like more, five minutes more, that's okay. I will aim for 20. So uh, good morning, everybody from Boston. Uh, good afternoon there in the Emirates. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much, Shokran, for joining us. I wish to start off by commending Ahmad uh, and Al Tamimi for its leadership in putting this important topic on the agenda. Um, in my brief keynote, I want to share with you the perspective on innovation from MIT and particularly its research around the world about good practice, taking ideas from inception to, to impact. And then I look forward to a conversation with Ahmad and answering any questions that you may have uh, put to him. So thank you, uh, Ahmad, for organizing this. Uh, this is me back when I was in the corporate world wearing a tie. Today, I'm in the academic world, uh, particularly focused on tech innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and strategy at MIT's management group. Uh, and I just wish to commend uh, Al Tamimi has joined an MIT group called the Industrial Liaison Partnership, uh, which gives great access to MIT, its thinking, and its faculty. I am a, an introduction to MIT, but I think this is a very helpful partnership for the Emirates that Al Tamimi has here. Uh, I will, of course, make all of these slides available at the end as a PDF, so uh, don't feel you need to copy everything down. So as you can tell from my accent, I'm at an American institution, but I'm British. And one of the things that strikes me about MIT is that it is good at innovation, but it's also a very international place. I have various friends here at MIT from the Middle East region, and MIT doesn't only look at America, it looks at what's going on in the world. But here, at, here in America, it does very well. It's a top ranked university and is also the anchor of a key ecosystem here around Kendall Square. What I'm gonna cover in my 20 minutes is I wanna talk about MIT's systematic approach to innovation, um, which explains why we talk about ecosystems and then particularly how do you build ecosystems? And we look at the one that's right outside of our windows, but we also study ecosystems from around the world. Now, I understand from the members of the panel, but also the audience that we have some very learned members of your university academic community. So I want to make sure that um, I provide some of the background on what I'm going to say. So a lot of very smart professors here at MIT study the science of innovation. What makes it work? Why does it happen in some places and not others? And then I, as a former diplomat um, and corporate banker, have worked on turning these into working papers. So for those of you who are interested, or for those of you who cannot sleep, I provide these links 
so that you can read further on these particular subjects should these be of interest. We start off with an innovation definition. And MIT is interesting because it's good at innovation, but it also studies innovation. So when the president of MIT launched an innovation initiative, one of the first things they had to do was define it. And I wanna share with you this short definition, not because MIT has any monopoly on wisdom, but I think it explains why we have this particular approach to innovation, which seems to have worked well. So our definition is eight words, the process of taking ideas from inception to impact. The thing that struck me as a senior lecturer, Dr. Phil, was it doesn't mention the word technology. We love technology. We're an institute of technology, but we don't put technology in our definition of innovation. But we do have eight words. We talk about the process. As Ahmad has already pointed out, this is not in his guide. This is not just a moment of invention. It's a whole process. The process of taking ideas along the journey from ideas from inception to impact. So it's not a lone person having a brilliant idea. It's about the system that allows that idea to have impact. Secondly, we have a lot of ideas out there. And the way to judge them, we think, is to see if it's a match between a problem and a solution. Many of our professors here at MIT are wonderful at creating solutions, but they don't know what problems they might solve. Here at MIT's management school, we have lots of people from business coming in who have business problems, but they don't know what the solution might be, except beyond a general sense of maybe AI. So idea is when you match the problem and the solution. You don't have to own the problem. You don't have to invent the solution to be innovative. It's a question of bringing the two together. And then finally, the word impact. Now we're a management school, not a business school. So we have a broader definition of impact, but profit is a perfectly fine form of impact. Making more money than it takes to run the business is good business. Whether you're a for-profit business or a not-for-profit or even a government agency or a university. But we see impact as going beyond just profit. And for many of our entrepreneurs here, they're interested in other bottom lines. Is it helping the local ecosystem? Is it being inclusive? Is it strengthening the economy and society? Is it helping the energy transition and being good for the climate? Is it achieving social justice? The final point is that we recognize the journey has many parties to it. It's not just about startup entrepreneurs. It's also about large corporations, nonprofits, governments, and universities, and most importantly, the many people who help them. The final point I'd like to make on innovation is that there is innovation out at the horizon, the kinds of things that university professors create, the kinds of things that venture capitalists like to fund because it has 10x impact. But there's also another form of innovation, which is little i innovation, which is much more modest, 10% instead of 10x, little i instead of big i. And this creates a spectrum because innovation in your society and your economy might not always be out at the horizon. Now, we are a management school, so we like to produce a matrix. As I said, an idea is a problem and a solution match. Today's solutions, solving today's problems, are business as usual. But if you go out on the various axes of novelty, where both sides are novel, then you do have big I innovation. This is the kind of ideas that your universities will probably be creating in their laboratories. Meanwhile, your large corporations are probably going to struggle doing more in the short term than little I innovation. And so you need people who can help bridge this gap and bring the ideas from the frontier to bear on today's business as usual. One final point that came out is there's often a great interest in startups and entrepreneurship. And it's important to look at the rankings and understand what's going on. We see two different types of enterprise. First of all, there are the small and medium-sized enterprises, the backbone of our economies. They're very important. But the real game changers are the innovation-driven enterprises, which are harder to create, They'll often come from science and technology from universities. And as you can see from this simplified graphic, whereas an SME has a simple income over time, linear growth, 
The innovation-driven enterprise costs more money. It goes into negative territory, but when it does take off, it has the potential to become exponential. Now here in America and increasingly around the rest of the world, people are talking about these IDEs as dolphins, as sorry, as unicorns, digitally focused IDEs, and they're very important. But there's another type of IDE, which we see the potential for the Emirates having, which are deep tech dolphins. These are IDEs that are based around the space exploration that your minister has launched, that are around deep, deep AI forms of machine learning and neural processing. And so the SMEs are very important. They're the backbone of the economy, but we'd like them to shift from being just like camels to much more gazelle-like. But the real focus of universities is creating IDEs, both the digital unicorn, but also the deep tech dolphins. Now, why does this matter? Well, almost 20 years ago, Friedman told us the world is flat. It turns out he was wrong. In terms of innovation, the world is not flat, but spiky. And such high-end innovation is geographically concentrated in ecosystems, uh, whether it's in Asia or in Britain. And we believe this logic seems to be holding true even after the COVID lockdown. Now, this matters to the Emirates, to Britain, to many countries in the world. And we work with many of these through our global program called REAP. Um, and so we have applied this theory now to over 70 teams in 70 regions around the world, as you can see from pretty much every uh, major country and every major continent. Uh, and for those of you with good eyesight, you will see that, yes, we have had several from the Gulf, including a team from Dubai, which I shall mention something about in a moment. But first of all, how do we take our insights from the universities and make them useful in the wider world? Well, we've made a simple version where innovation ecosystems can be understood and new ones built by using this 3S approach, stakeholders, system, and strategy. And I want to talk about the stakeholders first. As you know from the title, Ahmad has called this session um, the Triple Helix and Beyond, which is very sensible. Now, the Triple Helix is a very popular theory. Um, it basically says that you only need three players, government, industry, and academia. And so this theory is very popular with government, industry, and academia. Now, the problem is that if all you needed was these big three to create innovation, then we should all be good at innovation because everybody can create a committee of these. The problem is this theory was based on a study of MIT. And we don't think it was a correct reading of what goes on here. We at MIT ourselves have our own approach to stakeholders. And we say the big three are not enough. And therefore, it is misleading just to follow the triple helix. In fact, our analysis of MIT and what is happening here actually leads us to realize that there are two new stakeholders for 21st century innovation. And those regions who want to be good at innovation need to recognize that it's not just universities handing ideas to corporations and government agencies. There are two other players here in Orange, the entrepreneurs and their funders. And so we teach people around the world to actually see a five ecosystem, five stakeholder model for the ecosystem. And the two ones that we have had in here are the entrepreneurs and risk capital. Because without the right type of entrepreneur, those that are going to create those unicorn and dolphin innovation-driven enterprises, you're not going to get a full return on your investment for the money that is spent by universities elsewhere. And every team that comes into REAP has to have all five stakeholders. So as I mentioned, a few years ago, we had a team from uh, Dubai. Here is their web page on our REAP website. And as you can see, each one of the five stakeholders had to have a seat at the table, especially the entrepreneurs and their risk capital funders. Now, I mentioned the stakeholders. The second S is the system. And here we have a simplified graphic of the professor's research. And the piece I want to highlight is the central two, ICAP and ECAP, innovation and entrepreneurship. Much academic literature and many of the global rankings confuse these two inputs, whereas actually we find it useful to separate them out 
to create the twin engines of the system. Each side has the same type of inputs, for example, human capital, funding, but where a lot of regions fail to achieve their potential on innovation is where they don't work out the difference between them. So for example, on the input side for ICAP, when you talk about funding, a key measure there is R&D. So many global rankings just list the amount of R&D, but our approach at MIT is there's many other dimensions on the innovation side. Same on the ECAP side, People there often look at the funding level and just count up the number of venture capital deals. Unfun unfortunately, just having a large number of VC deals isn't enough to actually pull together a whole ecosystem. So as the academics will know, it's important to be careful about what you actually choose to measure. So we've drawn this together in a report here for those who wish to dive more deeply and for those of a digital nature um, we also have a web app online that allows people to, to work with this, to understand where they are and bench the, benchmark themselves against others, because this is a highly competitive process. The key takeaway for the audience today is that each of these five stakeholders contributes different resources to the innovation ecosystems. For example, universities turn R&D and input into patents, which is an intermediate measure on its way to creating innovation. And in the United States, the government changed the rules so that actually it makes it much easier under the Bayh-Dole legislation for universities to turn R&D into patents. So to apply that to our matrix here, an innovation ecosystem needs the 10X innovation from the horizon, which is often based on R&D patented by universities. But if the ideas just remain in patents and the tech doesn't get licensed or transferred out, then the ecosystem do, does not benefit. Instead, the world's best ecosystems require human agents, usually entrepreneurs, who license the patents and technologies and turn them, with the help of risk capital, into those all-important innovation-driven enterprises. So as I start to wrap up, let me just say we apply this theory of change um, through our REAP program. And so there are many places in the world that we see are already taking these lessons to heart and working out how do you help your universities turn the research and development they get from corporations or more likely government sovereign wealth funds? How do you turn that R&D into patents? And then who's going to help them get the patents out the door and into the hands of entrepreneurs? Because in the best ecosystems around the world, it does tend to be the entrepreneurs who make that difference. And as you can see, we've had a variety of teams from the Middle East who will be competing with the Emirates to try and take this forward. And that's how we do it. We take it through the, our REAP program. And over the course of two years, as we had with Team Dubai, we talk through how to optimize your particular system. As I say, it's been a few years since I've worked with Dubai, so I look forward to hearing Ahmad's questions, but also any questions from the rest of you. Uh, and here are my details, um, and I would be delighted to, to get in, stay in touch with people. So with that, let me stop sharing my slides, and Ahmad, let me turn it back to you for our discussion. Thank you very much, Professor, for the very insightful and interesting presentation. Uh, professor, to go a little bit in time, in, in the UAE, uh, our journey here in terms uh, of innovation has, has uh, started a few years back. I remember when I first came to Dubai in 2011, and then uh, we started to see uh, initiatives taken by the, by the leadership to promote innovation, spread a culture of innovation, so in 2014, 2015, we started to see the, the year of innovation in 2015, and afterwards, many initiatives at, at country level have been taken to spread this culture of innovation and incite uh, private sector and public sector alike to, 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 to innovate. Now, many uh, advancements have, have been made uh, so far. Now, uh, from the academia perspective, we, we see more inventions coming from universities. We, have, we see more entrepreneurs coming to the UAE. 
um, we have a good basis for that. The government is also taking a lot of initiatives from, even from the legislative perspective, a major reform, more than 50 laws have been reviewed or uh, adopted uh, recently in order to, uh, to uh, advance the legal ecosystem as well. Still, we feel that it's kind of a, you know, that uh, triple helix and beyond is like a, a chicken and egg game. So, uh, yes, you know, you have the different players, but what comes first, which uh, plays, which, you know, it's like, you know, a food recipe, you have all the ingredients, but, you know, you need to have the know-how, you know, what comes first and in which proportion and so on. How can, uh, what? Can you say about this? What is, is there a secret recipe MIT has used and a specific know-how you have in your hands and that, uh, you know, uh, if other countries have it can help them advance the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Ahmad, uh, a great question. Thank you very much for that. And, and let me just say on Dubai, it was a pleasure working with that Team Dubai, which was sponsored uh, by the Emir's executive office. And it was amazing, um, 2015, 2016, to see how seriously the government was taking the innovation agenda. Uh, we got to know about the, the, the plans, uh, Project 2071, the way they were going to review the laws. And in terms of doing my homework for today's session, it has been impressive what Dubai has been able to do, particularly on the innovation capacity side. I know from teaching uh, at the moment other teams in the Middle East, including one from uh, the eastern region of Saudi Arabia, they are very impressed with what Dubai and the wider Emirates uh, have done. Um, but yes, it's interesting. A lot of the regions we work with around the world have some great ingredients and yet aren't quite fulfilling their potential. They may be doing well on the rankings, GII, GEM, and others, um, but not actually achieving the success on the ground that perhaps they deserve given the amount of effort. Now, as a diplomat, I know that every region has its own particular nature. So we are not management consultants at MIT. We are fellow academics. And so we have no silver bullet to say this is the answer because the answer has proved different for uh, Dubai six years ago as it was for London, Lima, Peru, Israel, Singapore, uh, Los Angeles. So it's always slightly different, but there are some common themes. And so the common themes here are you need to get beyond the triple helix. If having good universities, good government and good corporations was enough, then everybody would be doing well. The places that do well also find a way to get the innovation into the entrepreneurship capacity. And it's interesting, if you look at the GEM readings, um, the desire to be entrepreneurial, for example, in Singapore, is very, very high. But actually, they don't produce many enterprises. And so there's a difficulty between asking people, do you feel entrepreneurial? And actually seeing enterprises, particularly the high-end innovation-driven enterprises, be appearing. So I think the interesting challenge from my brief review of the Emirates is you're doing very well on the innovation capacity side. Clearly, today's event is starting to bring together stakeholders beyond the triple helix. But I think one of the challenges will actually be to turn your world-class research and development, science and technology and innovation into your own homegrown innovation-driven enterprises. And so I think you have all of the ingredients you know the players you need to bring around the table. And sometimes it takes somebody like you, Ahmad, and Al Tamimi to bring those stakeholders together. Sometimes it's easier for an honest broker like a law firm to bring those five players together than to have government set up a committee or the universities set up a conference. But I think you have a lot of the ingredients. The challenge will be how to, to make that difference. And it's important because the rest of the world is not sitting still. In fact, the rest of the world, particularly the Middle East, is looking at the Emirates and the success they've had, and most of it can be copied. We feel that uh, this capital you know, is still reluctant in the UAE to invest into technology. We know that, for example, in the United States, 
um, uh, venture capital, speaking about venture capital, per capital before the uh, real estate crisis uh, in 2008 was, you know, focusing on real estate. And when that crisis happened, they started, you know, to look, to look beyond real estate. And that's how, you know, they started to, you know, we started to see more and more uh, venture and risk capital focusing on technology and deep technology and so on. We are yet in the UAE to see that level of this capital happening here and investing in technology. What needs to happen first in order to attract these, these entities and to open this appetite in the UAE, Professor? That's a great question, Ahmad, because risk capital is one of the five key stakeholders. Um, you know, I mentioned Singapore. They are very strong in several of them, but not in venture capital. The same with Hong Kong. Now, they have lots of capital because they're international financial centers, but portfolio capital and real estate capital is not the same as the venture capital that is willing to invest in these IDE ventures. Now, we talk to a lot of venture capitalists. Why do they do this? On the whole, they'll go where there's good entrepreneurs to support. Um, and so one of the challenges is to make sure that your innovation ecosystem is producing investment-worthy, innovation-driven enterprises. Not science projects and patents by themselves, but real businesses that the venture capitalists can invest in. Secondly, as we discovered working with our teams in Norway and Iceland, sometimes there are government policies that make it harder for those with capital to put a small amount of that into the venture capital bucket. And so Norway was trying to think through is it sovereign wealth fund funded by hydrocarbons? Is it got a policy that actually encourages it to support Norwegian startups? In the case of Iceland, a very small country, they discovered that the universities weren't getting their ideas patented and more importantly, into the hands of entrepreneurs because the universities themselves, though all great, were too small to have a world-class tech licensing office. So they ended up creating one for the entire region to help the good ideas wherever they came from, wherever the brilliant professor was sitting out of the door. And so it's much more important to look at your internal ecosystem and decide how do we optimize our ecosystem to produce things that are worth investing rather than try to chase after American venture capital. Although I will say one of the things that's happened due to COVID is that the Silicon Valley venture capitalists have discovered that they can invest over Zoom, which they funded, and don't need to have meetings face-to-face -face in Silicon Valley. So there's a real opportunity for ecosystems in this global competition to be good at this and to attract international venture capital. But the best way to do it is to put your own house in order, pull the ingredients and the stakeholders together, and actually make sure that you are producing startups that are actually worth investing in. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And I, I will ask the participants if they want to post their questions in the Q&A uh, uh, chat box. Please, please go, go ahead. I'll be taking uh, questions uh, from, from there. Uh, if, if you are to provide, and, and thank you very much for, for giving the example of Iceland, which is a great, a great example. I think, you know, many of the universities here have actually, um, uh, they do produce uh, you know, innovation, they do produce uh, patents. Now, one of the main challenges is monetization and you know, uh, bringing them to the market. <clears throat> and again, uh, we don't have in the UAE the large universities you, know, uh, you have in the US, such as MIT. Uh, for example, so uh, and and this is uh, where you know some small universities wouldn't have the capacity or to build full-fledged you know tech transfer offices here. So so I think the example of Iceland, if it has been tested there and and validated, that's 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 a great maybe example you know to uh, to uh, for us in the UAE uh, to, to to learn from. Um, 
if you are to provide the three recommendations to you know the the, the, the UAE high level you know recommendations in order to bridge specifically the gap between between um, the inception and the diffusion mm -hmm. to the market of innovations and you know to start with the quick wins you know small small you know success steps you mm -hmm. know without you know a, 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 Providing, you know, uh, or complicating, you know, the uh, or providing a full uh, complex uh, system inside. So, what your recommendations would be? That's a hard question, but I shall do my best. As I say, I have not been in Dubai for a couple of years. Um, but I have been chatting with my friends, so this is just an initial analysis, and I'd love to. Um, visit again and and come study well first of all do uh, emirates is you know honored to have such wonderful universities uh, in sharjah in dubai and abu dhabi so you should recognize the strengths that you have lots of people in the region are very jealous of the strengths you have so it's often a question about optimizing what you've got and so one of them is to check um how are the universities set up doing wonderful research and science and technology, how are the universities set up to help your smart professors actually turn their ideas and their research into patents? And so this is just a policy decision. How easy is the university system and the government making it for smart professors who will stay smart professors to get their ideas into patents? Secondly, how easy is it then for those who wish to be entrepreneurial and use those patents to create enterprises, how easy is it for them to license the technology? And we find here at MIT that we, we don't have a tech transfer office. Everybody assumes we do. We have a tech licensing office. And its only mission is to make life easy for the professors to patent their ideas and easy for the entrepreneurs, who are often the students of those professors, to turn it into startup enterprises. Um, and they do so by only taking a 5% equity stake. Some people think that a tech licensing office should make money. It shouldn't. It's just a service provider to get the ideas out of the university into the wider world. So given your audience today, Ahmad, I think the first two steps are to make sure the professors are being helped so that they can focus on their research and not spend time filling in patent documents. But secondly, to make sure that the, the students, and in many of our cases, it's our postgraduate students, our postdocs, who are taking these ideas forward because they're technically difficult. And only one in five of our MIT postdocs will get a job in academia. So the other 80% need to create jobs by creating their own startups and to make sure that you're optimizing that. And finally, within the circle of the five stakeholders, you need good partners like Al Tamimi and others who can help facilitate the system, who can help ease the way of turning the ideas into patents and patents into real innovation in the world that can has an impact. Now, I was going to say it's about six years since uh, Dubai went through the REAP program. So it would be remiss of me to say that it would be very interesting to have another team from the Emirates come through REAP to see the progress that the Emirates have made. Without doing such an analysis uh, and collaboration, we probably can't be too specific about where the small changes are need to be made. But I know from work in, in Qatar and various parts of Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel and Singapore and elsewhere, sometimes these small changes make a real difference. And so I would like to leave with a message of hope. You have so many world-class strengths and to achieve the potential and get a return on investment for that, you need to find a way to bring these ideas through patents, understand that patents are only an intermediate step. If having lots of patents meant you were successful, then IBM would be the biggest country in the world, company in the world. You need partners to help you take it and get it into the hands of entrepreneurs because that will then attract the venture capital. So hopefully, Ahmad, that was a limited, uh, a limited answer, but okay, that gives you some concrete things to check in the short term. Uh, it's it's always I mean simplicity makes makes miracles and you know the five percent policy it strikes me how how far it got MIT learning that and knowing that uh, MIT if we take the alumni of MIT and what they produce 
I think if I, I, I learned what my lesson from my, my MIT studies uh, two years back, uh, the alumni of MIT produce, if we to put together all, all the wealth produced by mm -hmm. the startups and companies, they produce the 10th economy in the world. Uh, yep. So, uh, so it's uh, true. And the interesting thing is, it's partly because we have brilliant people here from around the world, including from the Middle East region, but it's also the system. The system is designed to help people get their ideas out into the real world in a way that other great universities like Harvard and Yale have problems doing. And so it's a combination of the great people, but also the system and the support. But yes, the, the revenue of the alumni is the 10th largest economy in the world. And we just want to share this because we think everybody should have a chance to improve their innovation ecosystem. And however good they are, loads of others are now trying to compete as well. So it's important not to be complacent, but to continue to optimize and make the most of the ingredients that you have. One of the questions, Professor, uh, which was asked by, 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 the, by one of the participants uh, about the Bay Dole uh, Act. And so mm -hmm. what are the key changes which have been brought by this act and how did you see this on the ground impacting and changing things around? It's a great question. The, the Bayh-Dole Act is about 40 years old, and it was a fundamental act. A, it was a new deal between the government of the United States, which funds most of the research and development, and the universities. And it was a simple act, but what it did was it made it much more straightforward that the universities would own the intellectual property that came out of the R&D, not the government, but the government insisted that the universities do something with it and not just leave it on the university shelves. And so the Bayh-Dole Act was an intervention in the system dynamic that actually created um, a lot of the companies that then came out of this. At MIT, we had a lot of biotech companies. Uh, out of Stanford, they had a lot of internet consumer companies, uh, although MIT is pretty good at artificial intelligence too. And so this Bayh-Dole Act basically was a new deal between government and the universities that said, yes, we will fund the universities, but you cannot just publish and perish. You must turn the patents into something useful. And it was out of that that MIT made lots of money available, not only for its tech licensing office, but also to train its professors on how to turn their great ideas and science projects into patents, but then also to teach entrepreneurship to teach the students who are technically trained, how do you turn these into business enterprises? And this, though a very boring piece of legislation, was just the right type of intervention that was required to make the difference. But it wasn't just government and universities. We then needed IP lawyers. We needed people who could help entrepreneurs set up their enterprises and get the finances and the accounting right. So it actually led to a huge explosion and is one of the reasons that alumni startups are equivalent to the 10th largest economy in the world. Ahmad, I see a hand has gone up. Great, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, do we have any other question to Professor? I see Dr. Sharma has his hand up. May I call on him, Ahmad? Sure. Yeah, I'm one of the panelists, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask a question. Sure. But, uh, <laughs> It's a very interesting talk, Bill. Thank you for that. My question was, uh, it's a two-part question. The first one is, uh, I work in the technology transfer office, so our role is, you know, licensing, startups, all of that. So how is a technology transfer office different from a technology licensing office? And the second part is, uh, uh, you mentioned about the 5% uh, stake, hmm. uh, which MIT um, gets into a startup. Now, my experience in a lot of the UK universities have worked that we start off with five or ten percent, and then the um, the more work we uh, put in with the students as well as the inventors, the stake increases. How does MIT manage that balance? Sure. Or is that the same procedure what MIT does as well? It's a it's a great question, and I, I can uh, two questions, and I can take both together. So the MIT approach um, developed over the last forty five years. And, and Stanford has ended up the same, is that 5% uh, 
turns out to be about the optimum level. So the tech transfer office, and in our case, it's, it just licenses, just takes 5% equity in the hope that the startup does well. And it takes 5% because it's really important to give the entrepreneur the other 95% so that they can attract the venture capitalists. They can attract the support going forwards. And so it sounds counterintuitive. Only taking 5%? We're doing so much to help them. Why don't we take 50%? It turns out that most universities are not that great at helping entrepreneurs. And I say this with feeling because my home country, Britain, most of the universities there take 50%. And then they wonder why their entrepreneurs don't do very well. The reason is, if you take 50% from the entrepreneur, they only have the other 50% to play with as they try to grow their enterprise. And so what the universities need to do is only take 5% at the early stage. And our tech transfer, tech licensing offices, that's not the office that helps train entrepreneurs. That's a conflict of interest. We have entrepreneurship centers that train entrepreneurs. We have professors who can do courses. And so because our tech licensing office is very focused on licensing technology, it's not transferring the technology. The technology stays with the patent in the tech licensing office. It's just a licensing function. It then requires other parts of the university to step up and make sure it's training people, not only to be technically good, but to be entrepreneurial. In fact, in one assessment, um, the university spends about a tenth of its income, not on basic education and research and professor salaries, but 10% on things outside of tech licensing to help people grow their enterprises and to keep growing them afterwards. And so it's a very different model. The reason I think the MIT model has attractions is because it has led to so many wonderful world-class enterprises, as has Stanford. And I just don't see that many great enterprises coming out by the policy decision of taking more than 5%. Great. Thank you very much for your insight. And we'll jump immediately into the second session, just being conscious of time and some of the uh, panelists uh, might have uh, time limitations. So uh, I pass the ground to Dr. Nihal Shabrak to kick off the session number two. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. And uh, thank you, Dr. Phil. It was uh, very interesting listening to um, MIT experience in building innovation ecosystems. And um, this session that we are going to start now, it's a follow-up to what, what you discussed with Ahmed. And um, um, as you mentioned in the UAE, we have, I think the biggest number for of, of VCs uh, in the region and, uh, and also in terms of, um, you know, uh, tickets, we have the biggest ticket deals in terms of number and, and volumes. But the question is to know, do we have enough IDEs uh, that you mentioned uh, where actually those VCs can invest? And what is the role of academia uh, in, in, in doing so? So the purpose of this session is to, to talk about expectations uh, uh, from higher education institutions and how are they building their innovation systems and engagement with the triple helix and beyond. And, um, and actually, I allow me to uh, present our um, uh, panelists today uh, and we are honored to, to have with us. Uh, I will start first with Professor uh, Fahri Karai, who is the provost of the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, uh, the founding co-director of the University of Waterloo AI Institute, and who also held the uh, Doblos Research Chair in Artificial Intelligence and in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo, Canada. Uh, Professor Karai has published extensively in the general field of pattern analysis and machine intelligence, and uh, he is the author of 20 US patents. Uh, next, we have um, Dr. Yahya Marzuki, who is currently advisor to Tawazan CEO. 
since 2009, Dr. Yahya has assumed different responsibilities in Tawazun and before he worked for a major oil and gas company in Abu Dhabi uh, for more than 16 years. Uh, he also served on the executive committee of the Tautin program and later as a chairman of that committee. Uh, in addition, he is the chairman of the board of Hamdan bin Muhammad Smart University, College of mm -hmm. Business and Economics, member of the executive board of the UAEU College of Business and Economics, and member of Khalifa Innovation Center uh, Executive Committee. And from Khalifa, uh, Khalifa University, so we have also Dr. Sami Bashir. Uh, he is um, Director of Technology Management and Innovation at the university. Uh, Dr. Bashir has worked for over 20 years in technology and research commercialization both in industry and academia. Before Khalifa University, uh, Dr. Bashir worked at uh, Mazdar Institute and King Abdullah uh, University of Science and Technology in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where he was responsible for building technology transfer platforms and overseeing mm. the commercialization of their IT part portfolio. Um, we have uh, last but not least, Dr. Vibhav Sharma. I think I did well. <laughs> uh, who is an intellectual property and commercialization executive at the American University of Sharjah and who is uh, specialized in translating ideas stemming from the university into commercialized technologies. Um, I think we um, we don't have Dr. Mohammed Al Hamiri uh, Ahmed. Uh, no, I'm messaging him now. If I can have him join, he will. But go ahead, please. Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone, and um, let me start first uh, with the first question. Actually, I will I will I will ask the first question for our academic uh, panelists, and then I will turn to uh, Dr. Yahya Marzuki with another question. So my question, let me start with you, Professor Fahri. Um, can you share with us how your institution drives knowledge creation and transfer to foster social and economic growth, the impact side that uh, Philip was talking about? And more specifically, how do you support faculty and researchers and educate students to be innovators and grow enterprises. So the faculty innovators may be the students growing enterprises as it was again uh, mentioned by uh, Philip to respond to society and market needs. Thank you very much, Nihal. Thank you for the invitation, everyone. And thank you, uh, Salah Ahmed uh, for uh, uh, the invi uh, invitation again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Phil, for uh, an excellent presentation as well. I enjoyed it. Um, and it has a lot of uh, insights that apply, I mean, not uh, only to MIT, but uh, to also major uh, technology hubs that have the tradition of translating uh, ideas into product and into uh, successful, I mean, uh, um, uh, companies at, uh, at the end. So uh, yeah, congratulations on uh, contributing to this uh, effort. Uh, to, to your question, Nihal, uh, as you know, Mohammed Ben Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence is uh, a new university. It is new, uh, unique in its, um, uh, in its uh, area of uh, research. Basically, it is a graduate uh, research university that is specializing into the niche of artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, whereby uh, we, we teach uh, courses and we provide um, uh, research work uh, in the field of machine learning, uh, in the field of computer vision, natural language processing, and with application to a variety of fields. And um, the university is still new, it's only two years or two years and a half, but uh, we have wanted it to be from the start uh, a node of activity here in the area which can shine not only academic uh, work or research type of outputs, 
but we want to also to convert some of the knowledge that our students and our faculty are providing to our students and researchers into tangible type of product. So um, we have in a number of our courses, what we uh, say uh, the area of operational artificial intelligence, where we utilize the tool of AI and then we ask our students, uh, I mean, helped and mentored by our faculty member to translate it into small products through certain type of research project. So we have had that thing, I mean, in the academic type of teaching, but we also have uh, integrated this uh, this ecosystem with an IP protection and uh, licensing uh, technology for that our faculty members and our students are creating. And we have started to have at least now two startup companies that have been created by our professors and our students. And this has happened only a few months ago with the help of our uh, part uh, partners, with the help of industrial uh, providers of uh, the, pr the problem provided by the industry in the healthcare system, and also by the support from the industry, which gave office resources and also IP protection through our legal department. So we are getting into that mode that MIT has uh, pioneered for almost more than 100 years now alongside with major other companies and um, we tend to expand and to, uh, to, uh, to, to work on this particular type of channels involving our faculty and the students in do, into this particular ecosystem that uh, acknowledge uh, innovation and uh, knowledge creation. Wonderful, amazing. We would be more um, interested to, to, you know, to, to know a little bit more about what you mentioned, like this collaboration, uh, you know, with industry and other, you know, professional service providers. But let me first go to uh, Dr. Sani Bashir. How about uh, you tell us a bit more about what you do in Khalifa University and um, your experience uh, regarding knowledge creation, uh, transfer, mm -hmm. economic and social impact, your students, your faculty, etc. Well, thank you again, uh, Nihal, for the and Tamimi actually for the invitation, being part of this panel. Um, actually, I found that myself as well. I'm learning more than uh, contributing. So, so I thank Phil, I thank Ahmed for the initial session. It's, it's very interesting. And um, yeah, um, thank you for the invitation again. <clears throat> Let me be brief really, and give you some perspective on much, uh, it won't be the detailed part that we do in Khalifa University, it's just kind of an overview of what's going on. You know, innovation, uh, obviously this is a um, word now really, is everything evolving around it, especially in, in Khalifa University as, as other universities, great emphasis into this part. And if I want to just give a summary, I think one part that I'm not aware of, but I know is happening really towards the student and the academic teaching where, where innovation is becoming part of the academic course, is part of the intake, not forgetting Khalifa University really is primarily science engineering and, and medical and health sciences. So really there is some part going into the student side and um, from handling the projects and um, looking at some of the courses that focus on, get a little bit of academic learning about the, the entrepreneurship innovation, how it can help in their career and that part. There is another part coming from my office, which really part of the research of the university of capturing um, novel uh, ideas, uh, inventions, try to translate them into, into uh, intellectual property. Mostly are patents, but other things happening, especially I think what Professor Fakhri is mentioning, the artificial intelligence, some parts now is becoming more prominent is the copyright aspects of, of software and how you can introduce this into the, into the intellectual property coming out of academy. The third part, which is really hands-on um, entrepreneurship, and this is really where we have a uh, Khalifa Innovation Center. Um, Dr. Yahya is, as you mentioned in the introduction, is part of its executive committee. And this is really, um, I would consider it as a deep tech incubator, really taking those patents, taking those ideas, those scientific principles, concepts at early stage, and try to gather around them some business entrepreneurial activities that hopefully will lead into 
into startups at the earlier stage. So really we look closely at the academic side. We look closely at the research and trying to capture that part on, and then transfer it into the IP. One point here to add really, um, because Phil mentioned it about the, about the buy doll and the IP policies and all this. Actually, we have a, a very incentivizing um, policy in terms of IP from our technology transfer. So we don't take equity at all. We, we are trying to help um, entrepreneurs. You don't forget, we are, are, are still at the early stage. So we give royalty and we're capping this royalty just on 5%. In fact, we give even more incentives to, to startups. Uh, the idea behind it really is to encourage as much as possible students um, to take those um, ideas and technologies to take it further into uh, startups. And, um, and the Khalifa Innovation Center, even doing more than that, is, is, is initiating some uh, funding. It's not that big funding. You are not talking about seed funding or, uh, or in uh, phase one or two, but it gives really generous funding whereby the students can, can initially um, get a business feasibility, uh, market their technology, make some customer validation, a little bit of prototyping, depending on the technology and all this, get some senses about, about the, 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 the business opportunity based on those technology and hopefully make them a little bit ready to share this um, valid uh, opportunities with either business partners, uh, investors, or, or other industries to, to help in accelerating, pushing these uh, ideas from the lab to the market. So this is just a summary and overview of um, what's going on at, at, at Khalifa University in parallel to the partnership we have with the Khalifa Innovation Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Sani. And um, Dr. Weber, can, can you explain to us what is going on in uh, AOS and how are you supporting uh, your innovators, entrepreneurs? Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I think we are all in agreement now after this discussion that uh, one of the major roles of universities is to promote innovation. AUS is very strategically placed in this ecosystem. So we have close association with the Sharjah Research uh, and Technology Center, which um, allows us to access their industrial network to promote technology. So research that comes out of AUS, we have access to industrial partners and uh, understand what their concerns or uh, uh, issues in their business are, and then we can go back to the drawing, drawing board and uh, strategically find solutions. We're also closely associated with Shara, which is the Sharjah Entrepreneurial Center, and that gives access to startups. Now, they've supported around 100 startups uh, in, in the Emirate. So this gives access to students as well as faculty members to uh, understand the startup journey, which can be a very complicated and a difficult one. So it's important to understand that and also speak to colleagues, peers who have done that journey, who've been part of that journey and learn from their experiences. And then comes the technology transfer office, which is where we sit and we act like a bridge between all these parties and uh, promoting research to the park as well as to Shara, as well as having regular discussions with our faculty and staff, students, and um, understanding what research is happening within the university and how we can protect it. And uh, we also organize regular seminars and um, events where uh, we can get the key stakeholders involved in this ecosystem and create a platform for discussion to take place. So I think that's what uh, AUS is doing in this, in this ecosystem. And, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, and, and, and again, actually, the ecosystem in Sharjah is extremely interesting, and we will be talking a little bit more about all these interactions. Dr. Yahya, um, you, you have different hats. You are extremely close to academia with all your appointments you know, in the, in the, in the boards uh, in different universities, but also uh, you are close to government, you are close to industry. So what do you think about the role? Or what, what are the expectations actually from higher education when it comes to preparing uh, innovators and entrepreneurs? And, and 
do you think that um, we, 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 they, let's say they are fulfilling those expectations? Can they do better? What do you think? Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank Tamimi, uh, yourself and Ahmed for putting this uh, great uh, webinar the, uh, and, and bringing thought leaders. And I would like to thank Dr. Phil who articulated uh, very well the whole ecosystem that would lead to, uh, to a success. So thank you very much, Dr. He was very enlightening answer. Uh, I think we, you know, we have come a long way this is not to blow our own trumpet, but uh, in a short period of time, uh, in a country where the, the total economy is dependent on hydrocarbon, on oil, and, and then we, you know, the, the leadership side to diversify the economy and move away from the oil and gas and understanding that, you know, it's a, innovation used to be seen as a as a luxury, if it's ain't broken, don't touch it, you know? And now it is a necessary, it's a question of survival. So, so how do we do that? And, and uh, uh, academia, we're you know, operating in silo, industry, we're operating in silo, government is operating again with their legislation, you know, separately. But over the last decade, I think we have come a long way. We have attracted brain to the country. I think uh, we superseded, I don't know, if I can make the comment, the, the other country, I don't want to mention any particular country with attracting brain. Uh, we want to retain this brain in, in the country. Uh, and also the, the, the funding, uh, financial sector maturity, you know, has not been there. But now they start stepping up to the plate. Uh, you know, they, they look at the startup and they want to see the balance sheet, not the contract they got, but the balance sheet. It just uh, doesn't tally. Now, when it comes to academia and, and industry, uh, there is a, you know, in a, you know, people, the other in a, like a MIT and US and the West, they have gone through the pain process where they are now. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the academia are busy, uh, you know, doing the research in their domain, uh, particularly at the TRL one, two, three at the max. Uh, for citation, for publication, to extending the body of knowledge. And I'm not uh, against that. Basic research is fundamental to any academia. But I think there has to be 30, uh, 30 to 40% or 25 to 30, I don't know the exact percentage, that link to the, you know, the challenges of society, the challenges of industry. And therefore, they both have come together. We as an industry, we operate that, oh, if there is a proof of concept, if prototype has been done. So we are operating at TRL six and above. So as, as you all know, who's gonna pay for this value of death? Who's gonna pay for this product? Because some of the research does not produce a result right away. There, there has also been, because we, we, we have grown, so the growth of the country has been so fast, we also attracted some, some of the, the faculty that don't have, they have never stepped into the industry. They have done their bachelor degree, master degree, PhD, and then they are teaching. And sometimes we don't see eye to eye. We, we just, it doesn't, uh, you know, we don't understand one another. I think that is changing. Industry now we represented in the, into the university recruitment panel, that's a change. So it's a, it's a, it's a change of, of, of culture. I think we have moved uh, quite a lot. We have achieved a lot. This is not to say there is a lot of area for improvement, uh, but also the, this copy and paste doesn't work. We need to, uh, to uh, adopt and adapt. You know, we need to, to suit it for our environment because sometimes uh, this is not to say we don't need to benchmark. We need to, you know, to incorporate those benchmarks, those learning. Life is too short for all of us to make uh, all, the, uh, all the mistakes. And, and the, another issue is, is a, I think is impediment to the, uh, in a way, is the, the ownership of IP. I see a lot of students comes to me, they say, uh, Doc, can we talk to you after six months? I have a, a great idea. I say, why can't you talk now? He say, if I talk now, 80% of my IP is gonna be taken by university. But in six months, I'm graduating. So this kind of teething out uh, the, 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 the process uh, and also, but, but the, the ecosystem we have created quite a lot of business incubator, business accelerator, moving ahead, I think is connecting the dot. 
and 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 making sure that uh, uh, some of the com- also from the industry industry in the past they have been vertically integrated there is no opportunity for somebody to come in now we are moving to cluster that some of them are outsourced because we have this belief that we do the best the other don't know who said that uh, so, so the, the, this, the, the, we, are, we are challenging this mindset. This paradigm shift is uh, uh, is taking place. We are closely working uh, with the university. We are sharing our problem and our challenges uh, with the with the academia, and they have. A, and we are also addressing what they call it WFM. What is in it for me? I mean, and and the, and the faculty they 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 started to to working with us. One area also, I'm, I'm going to conclude that is the. You know, pro, uh, faculty uh, and doctors and brains who are, you know, uh, in academia, they are also assigned too many hours teaching. They don't have time to come to me and work for industry. And, and we started collaborating because their time is full. So I think university need to take uh, some fat in their organization so they can free uh, some of their professors. That would require that we fund some of the, you know, uh, uh, areas in the university. Uh, some of the organization, we started entrepreneurship within our organization. We have group of people that are working in manufacturing. We assign them three or four of them to do a particular job. And later on, our intention is to divorce them, to, to take them out of the company. And now they still can pay their rent. They can put food on the table. They can put their kids in school. Uh, and, and later on, once they become perfect, they, they can leave and and they can become so good at that particular, you know, thing that they we are assigning to do, and and go from the UAE to market. We have a superb infrastructure. We had to, you know, the few years back, uh, in the last decade, we had to put our back office in order. The, the financial legislation, the 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 infrastructure. These are all now we have uh, one of the best in the world. So I think is now creating here, and then from. From UAE to the world, that's the concept. Sorry for, I, 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 I talked a lot, but this is the, the whole notion that, of a, are we getting closer with academia? The answer is, is, is yes. Are we talking together? Much, much better than, uh, than, than, than before. I hope yes. I answered your, your, your question. Uh, absolutely. And, and thank you for, uh, for this, uh, very deep and interesting answer, which there is a lot actually that could be discussed and for a long time. Uh, let me go back to you, Professor Fahri, and you were talking about these two startups, although actually, as you mentioned, it's a new institution, but already we have uh, two startups. And something that you mentioned, which is extremely important, is that the origin, somehow you pull those ideas from industry. So it's that collaboration that you had with industry that, um, you know, provided you with these problems for which actually uh, you as an institution try to bring, mm. you know, the solution and match. And, and, and as a result, you have, you know, um, these startups. So can you tell us a little bit more about how do you, describe the collaboration between your university and industry so far and uh, how how do you see how do you see this you know uh, uh, you know affecting research um, you know innovation and also what are the challenges you perceive at this level You, you are muted. Yeah, I was saying thank you, Nihal, and uh, thank you to my colleagues who have gone through a spectrum of issues, I mean, at the university level or, uh, I mean, within the government uh, level as well. Uh, the issues have not been resolved, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, but uh, things are getting better. Things are getting better. And the, the university now is speaking in a seamless way to more industry and the industrial people are no longer shy to come to the university and to seek certain type of solution. And those are uh, excellent type of uh, path for, I mean, uh, speaking with each other 
as it lay the grounds for people from the academia and the in, uh, university to come together from and the industry to come together and discuss uh, things that did not used to be there. Uh, one of the aspects that has encouraged this particular uh, type of activity is the fact that uh, now, you, industry uh, requests for a number of workshops in the field of AI, for instance, and machine learning, introductory material in various type of area. So uh, various type of industries in various type of domains are approaching us to uh, seek professors who can teach their managers or their decision makers to provide some insights about the tools of AI and how they can be used in this particular type of fields. And during this type of workshop, during this type of meetings, a number of things happen. So they start talking with each other. The students, most of the time, are present during this type of meetings. And then the second, oh, yeah, you spoke about something that I have interest in and I would like to solve it. I would like to, if you have a solution for me, I can see from your presentation that there is some interest there. So this starts to happen. This is a good dynamics that is happening. So now, hopefully, and this is what is happening now that the university now is providing seed funding from government agencies and from research funding agencies to support certain uh, type of uh, uh, ideas that are born at the, the university, which they can uh, use them later. So I see some sort of dynamics there. And the good thing about it is that uh, some of our faculty members have started to become entrepreneur there themselves. And our students also have been instructed on taking their, uh, uh, their uh, problems that they solve during a certain type of uh, assignments or final exam or midterm, their projects, and they try to make out of them a certain type of uh, a tangible type of uh, prototype. So there is this particular aspect, and I feel that this is going to increase in the future especially with these type of IP protection uh, mechanism and with these type of uh, technology licensing offices that are uh, spawning in various type of universities. So I'm quite optimistic on that. So thank you, thank, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sami, can you tell us a little bit about the experience you had with industry? And, you know, how do you see that collaboration has affected you know, innovation, um, research programs, and also, um, uh, you know, education in the university. And what are the challenges so far you, 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 you think that are somehow, um, you know, um, um, slowing a bit, you know, this collaboration that you want to have with industry? This is actually a very challenging question, Nihal. So um, I don't know if to say thank you or say, uh, oh, is it so problem? But, uh, it, you know, it comes because it comes at a different um, place. Uh, let me tell you something. And um, let me first kind of put a little bit of definition and categorization on industries. I think we have a good relation, very well established relation with industries as universities. The, the, the two challenges coming, we're missing a gap on the industries. I'm talking about SMEs, you know, this is one of the problems that really we need to think about it. When there are some data, some studies where SME is really the drivers of the, of the, uh, of the economy and uh, Phil mentioned about that early technology adopters. So, so you kind of have a mature um, uh, companies, entities that they can take some technologies further and they're thirsty for new technologies and we find them as a good customer or potential good customers. I think here we have a challenge in reaching out those guys, um, the, the SMEs. So you find that the relation is very established with well um, unicorns, if you call them at UAE terms, uh, industries. This is, this is well known and also they have the, the social responsibilities. They know that they have to support the academia in getting things moving to the right direction. And, and this is great. I think the challenge comes from that, how to move these industries from um, a, um, a kind of looking for new technologies, uh, searching for new business opportunities in a way of that, how you can create win-win innovation partnership. And, and this is one of the challenges. And, not only on the industries, but also I think on our shoulders as universities. And primarily I want to uh, 
zoom into the IP issues that, that, that my colleagues, Professor Fakhri and Dr. Yahya, um, uh, um, kind of uh, touched on and, and talked about it, is that how we can be smart in engineering an IP model that can create win-win. So you are always in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a position of that, for example, the industry comes with a one um, size fits all. All IP has to come with industries, you know, because this is uh, where our business opportunity, this is where our fund and all these things. With the innovation, you find the saying, no, why don't you keep a little bit with the university just to help us do further research, possibly um, touch base into some uh, um, commercialization efforts that we would like to do. You find me always, uh, you know, going into negotiations, look, it's better commercialized with a professor, all these things going on. But to be honest with you, I think um, uh, turning the mindset of industries of that look beside us sponsoring and getting some of the results into our business, improve our business. This is why we gave you the money and the sponsorship, looking at them with more flexible eyes. Like for example, we try even sometimes to include the startup possibilities within our IP research terms, because sometimes the startups can be a little bit of uh, offsetting some of the risk, you know? Why don't you, if we are doing a graphene um, and you are interested in making some uh, water membranes, if this graphene can be used in lithium batteries or something and uh, give the researchers the, the part of having that, we are happy to get a joint venture with you, have some shares and all this. So. I think this is the, the IP still seems a little bit of problem in summary to move the, our industries, especially if they are big industries, very difficult to, to negotiate, you know, very difficult to negotiate with them. They are well positioned, well established, supported and all this. And, and for, also it's most of the funds that we're getting in our research. So engineering a win-win scenario is still becoming a challenging. Um, looking back as well, um, relation of industries with the startups. Um, if we consider the startups are part of our university ecosystem, which I don't know, legal people might say to you, no, you know, Ahmed is sitting there. This is a separate entity running their own businesses. But we need that support in terms of prototyping, product validation, um, uh, 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 this kind of the business opportunities that potentially startups are uh, thriving or seeking to validate their businesses. Uh, don't forget the, the the ecosystem is really in technology field is growing. So if you have someone who is developing a membrane or a battery or a, I don't know a software, there are one or two or three maximum big companies that they can support them in testing and validation. It's not like uh, what Phil is talking about the the U.S. ecosystem in terms of size and all these things where you can go Silicon Valley or you can go the East Coast, Boston, and all these things. Here really we are. We are very limited in terms of trying to search. And also one of always the concern, if it's high level technologies, we would like it to be tested and validated within our jurisdiction um, for different reasons. And, and this is always a preference. I think industries, they are especially established when we need that flexibility in business engagement, not only B to B or B to uh, A, if it's an academic, but also more B to S, if this is a stands for a startup as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Sami. Uh, Vaibhav, how, I mean, um, how is the case in, in, in your institution? Because you have, I mean, you know, compared to Haifa University and Mohammed bin Zayed University, you have um, the Sharjah research and technology part, which you mentioned uh, in your first answer is playing a role uh, in connecting you with uh, with industry, so how how do you how do you characterize the collaboration mm. that you have in the specific context of Sharjah? So it's a very symbiotic relationship between uh, academia and uh, industry. Universities develop the they work in the R&D, they develop the, uh, the solutions to the problems and it's the industry then takes it forward. And that's how the innovative cycle or innovation cycle is complete. Now at Sharjah, we have direct, as I mentioned, we have direct relationships with the park. Uh, how it works is we, uh, we have constant discussions with the park and their um, industrial partners and we're promoting our research. We discuss with them or mention to them what research is coming out of the universities. 
I think that the biggest challenge, and I think everybody on the panel has mentioned the challenges, including those, I think I'll speak from a faculty point of view, because they, those are the first people who go and promote their research at conferences, at events. I think the problem they face or what they come and tell us is uh, they're not able to get their ideas higher up the ladder. The problem is they meet people in, um, at conferences or events and uh, they meet people who are not able to make the decision about, they can't give them a yes or a no. And by the time it either reaches the top of the ladder, a lot of time has passed and either of the parties are not interested or um, it just never reaches the people who make these decisions. So I think if they can have access or if we can have platforms where they can have access to the right people who have a better, bigger vision of their company and the industry, uh, maybe it might be an easier way to find these solutions. But, um, and also I think the second point is the risk uh, taking. Are they willing to take that risk and uh, put their monies on a technology which is at an early stage and uh, and to see benefits of it maybe in a few years' time? Are they are they um, able to take that risk or are we able to convince them? So I don't know, either we are not convincing them well or they're not ready to take that risk. So we need to find that balance. Thank, thank you so much. Um, back to you, Dr. Yahya. So... You, you talked about your point of view on um, the efforts by academia, uh, but if I ask you, uh, like from the point of view of industry and coming to you know, that collaboration that we want um, with academia, how, how do you describe the challenges, but from the industry side, what are the constraints? Why actually we don't see more, you know, industry, uh, uh, you know, sponsored research, for example, in academia? Why don't we see more open innovation? Why don't we, like, what are the constraints from your side? That's a, that's a million dollar question. Uh, I think it's a, T trust is earned but not given, perhaps, uh, if I can uh, use the term. And, and, and it is, uh, you know, it is a two-way sword, uh, which one is an eggs and chicken. And I think we also gotten into that as, as an industry also gotten uh, into that uh, as well. For example, I, you know, I would like from, you know, some of my doctors who are, who are working in industry uh, here with us to go and, and lecture at university so and, and vice versa as well so we can create that uh, so this is there is an uh, I think a blockage there the second I found uh, us uh, a lot of the, the the ideas that are coming in science and technology some of the the, the idea holder, they don't have a business acumen. They're engineers, and, and you don't. So they don't have a business business ac uh, acumen. Now, I, I think you know through perhaps uh, you know the, the incubator they need to incorporate into their boot camps and and bring them. Uh, you know, some I you know I listened to. Uh, I was in one of the you know investment uh, committee, and there was a pitching time, and this you know there was five six team. They came to us and they presented and we rejected one saying that oh it doesn't have a commercial viability. Later on, I got a chance to sit with this, he asked me for a coffee. A was brilliant idea, but he couldn't present. We had the, nobody had prepared him how to pitch, how to put his idea forward, how to convince the other side. So as, as basic as it looks, it's very important. The mentorship, protege type of relationship is, 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 a, is, a, is a vital. Uh, now, and, and you know, and, and I think it's a, we are going through the maturity curve. Uh, we were this link. We were operating the industry. We're operating is in silo, academia in silo, uh, like uh, you know, a firm from the MBZU, uh, 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 artificial intelligence uh, state. Now we, you know, we are working together in MBZU. We have a 129 or 122 uh, PhD that they have done. Uh, you know, their PhD thesis in artificial intelligence. More than 30 of them are here in Abu Dhabi. So how can we, how can we partner together? How can we um, you know, shake hands with each other to, to, to create an awareness of artificial intelligence? They have started the program, for example, of uh, 
bringing CEOs and C-level and having eight weeks program and, and becoming uh, aware. Because if the, the top tier, they are not aware, anything comes down, it gets pushed, uh, it gets, you know, declined. So, so there is a, a lot happening. Uh, I don't want to, to articulate the particular problem, um, uh, Nihal. But, uh, but there are challenges uh, that we are, you know, working, uh, working it uh, through. But uh, I, all of us, I think arrows are pointing in the same directions. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that, that this exponential changes will take place and will take place soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Yahya. Um, I think actually we are running out of time. And uh, I mean, I want to ask our audience if they have any question to address to our panelists. Um, um, before we conclude this session. So please go ahead and either you write in the chat or in the Q&A and we will address this question to our panelists. Ahmed, do you have any question? Oh, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, you know, this kind of discussion, you know, we can have it for not only for one hour and a half, you know, we can have it for days and days. And, you know, I can say um, uh, I'm so, so happy and proud of, of this discussion. It went uh, a long way since I first came to the UAE in 2011. And um, and I remember when when I when I first came uh, and uh, they asked me why did you come to the UAE and actually it's mentioned in one of the publications I said I came with a dream to see the era of Ibn Sina coming back from the UAE and I think you know uh, what makes me. Um, you know, wake every morning motivated and energetic is seeing this dream becoming an objective and a closer step forward every day to this objective. And this is, of course, thanks to our, you know, visionary leadership and that we cannot thank enough doing the best to our people and thanks to people like you who are working days and nights to move the innovation ecosystem and entrepreneurship ecosystem forward day after day. So um, on this note, I would like to thank you enormously uh, for making this event a success. I want to thank our participants uh, to make it a success. And I would like to, uh, to, to, to thank um, all the team, uh, Al Tamimi team, who has been working hard to make this event a success. I know a lot of you thank me. I can't take all this credit myself. The success and the credit goes to all the team behind it, including marketing, IT, logistics. And we have worked hard to prepare this, this, this conference, this event, uh, and the entire legal research team behind. So I would like to thank you all. And, uh, and we will work, continue to work hard as a family and company. We're committed to play a very active role in doing our best to make this objective becoming becoming true and with your, with your help and your support we have no doubt that we will achieve it and of course uh, with our uh, with the guidance and the directions uh, and the plans uh, put uh, together by our our leadership so on this note i would like to wish you all a wonderful day and looking forward to our next uh, event